<laughs> if you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, what's the creepiest urban legend you've ever heard or seen? I believe people refer to them as stick Indians. Out in the deserty areas of the USA, there are roads that go insane distances with absolutely nothing nearby. No gas stations, no homes, just barren ass land. Longest one I've been on was, Irk, 76 miles between a couple towns in Oklahoma. There was legit a sign that indicated no gas or rest stops next 76 miles. Many of them are much longer. The legend is that people traveling these roads, especially at night, will see people on the side of the road, a hundred or more miles from anything. They look normal, wear normal clothes, except they're nine plus feet tall when you get close to them. A lot of truckers have reported seeing them. I think it's an uncanny valley thing. Totally normal environment with one normally insignificant detail very out of place. Heard a different legend about stick Indians. I met a kid my age while drinking and taking in the view on a hill in my neighborhood, he was also there to drink and we started shooting the shit. As it got dark we started telling scary stories, he said this one was told to him by his uncle who was Tongva. Stick Indians are some of the most evil spirits around. He said their real name isn't even Stick Indians, but in the woods he couldn't tell me what it was. You're going walking in the wilderness, following a creek bed. The wind is rushing through the trees and the bushes. You start to listen to it. Closer and closer, until it starts to take on a sort of rhythm. It may start to sound like voices. Laughter. Mocking laughter. Continue walking. Eyes upon your path. As though you never noticed. As the voices become more clear, you may hear more. Children crying, animals whimpering. You may hear other things. Horrible things. Continue walking. Eyes upon your path. As though you never noticed. You may hear the sound of dogs panting, then whining, then yelping, then screaming, like a human, louder and louder and the laughter louder too until the crying stops with a last yelp and only the laughter remains. You will hear women being violated feet from your ears. You will hear children being chased, and being caught, and begging, and though you do not speak their tongue, you will know that they are begging to be killed. And above all you will hear the laughter. Callous laughter, devoid of joy. Continue walking. Eyes upon your path. As though you never noticed. You won't see the stick Indians unless you try and look for them. But if you look for them, you'll see them. And if you see them, then they might see you. My wife grew up in St. Joseph, Michigan. On the outskirts of town was a long, creepy tunnel that ran under the highway. It was said that once you crossed to the other side of the tunnel you entered Melonhead territory. Melonheads were deformed people who would find your car, beat it with clubs, and drag you screaming into the dark, dense woods. Scared the shit out of her as a little girl when her older brother took her her friend for a ride there. She took me once and I agree it had a very ominous feel, but by then had mostly been converted to high-end housing. Still an interesting story though. Not sure if this is an urban legend, but it's scary as hell, at least to me. My grandmother used to tell it to all the kids in the neighborhood. My very Greek grandmother was incredibly superstitious. She always told me, whatever you do, never speak aloud in the dark. One time, I asked why. Because someone might just answer you damn okay. Girl goes to a club with another female friend. They party through the night and she actually connects with a guy and ends up kissing him making out. They exchange contacts but he wants her to go to his place, he gets quite desperate and tries to convince her. Her female friend gets wind of it, even though he seems alright she urges they'll part ways for the time being since it's too late and they're all drunk. They leave the club and go to each their own place. The next morning the girl doesn't feel quite well, while looking in the mirror she also notices, what looks like some form of a rash or herpes around her mouth. She doesn't think much of it but goes to the doctor anyways. The doctor isn't sure what it is exactly and suspects bacteria slash viral infection. He takes a tiny sample from her skin and sends it to the lab. About a week later the doctor calls and wants the girl to come visit him ASAP. He tells her the results are very suspicious, something only really seen from contact with corpses. They're both shocked. The girl tells the doctor about the guy she made out with at a club. After some additional research she did at home, she discovers the guy very recently got arrested on suspicion of killing a girl a couple of weeks ago. They found a dead girl's body at his home under his bed, lying there decomposing. The Mexican Pet A young woman from Southern California, while on a shopping trip to Tijuana, Mexico, noticed a cuddly canine squirming in the gutter. The animal was a tiny chihuahua, struggling for its life, breathing heavily, shivering, barely able to move. Heartbroken, she smuggled her new pet across the border and then struggled to help it regain its strength. 
The puppy refused to eat any food she offered, and she talked to it, cuddled it and finally wrapped it in a small blanket and placed it beneath the covers on her bed to sleep beside her all through the night. She kept feeling it to make sure it was okay. In the morning the tiny pet still seemed sickly. She cuddled and kissed it all morning, but noticed weeping from its eyes so she brought it to a nearby animal clinic. Handing the weakened animal to the vet on duty, she began to describe all the things she had done to help the tiny creature. The vet immediately asked the women where they had acquired their pet. Learning about her trip, he informed the women that she had adopted not a chihuahua, but a rabid Mexican river rat. When I was a kid living in Texas, I had a recurring dream. In this dream, I was walking down the street of my hometown, and a man would walk toward me. Sometimes he was older and sometimes he was younger. He didn't always have the same face, but I always knew it was the same man. He would get closer and closer, and I would know that something bad was going to happen, but I would wake up each time before he reached me. I would be terrified. One night, in my dream, we finally got face to face and I spoke to him. I said, what is your name? He said, my name is Sammy. And then I woke up, and I was so afraid that I couldn't go back to sleep. I went to my sister's room and said, can I get in bed with you? I've just had a really bad dream. My sister said, was it Sammy? I said, what did you say? How do you know Sammy? And my sister said, I don't. But you just brought him in the room with you. I turned on the lights and I saw that my sister was asleep. Definitely the goat man is told by a Nancy. The goat man is already an urban legend, but that particular story slash telling of an experience perfectly distills the horror of it. A being that infiltrates a small group seemingly effortlessly and without question, but so non-human it only mimics speech without comprehension. Like an animal that had learned the trick of speaking. It rests in the uncanny valley of creatures. We have a local urban legend that I heard of recently. A creek that runs through the south side of the county was once a hanging ground for disobedient slaves. The bodies were then cut down and let go in the creek. Children of said slaves were left in the woods to die or were drowned. It's said now that if you go down there, you hear the screams of the dead or a baby crying for its mother. Hunters, white men in particular, are scared to go down into that trek of the woods because of said spirits. My coworker told me that he was near the area once with his dogs chasing rabbits and suddenly a dense fog rolled in. He started hearing screaming and noped out of there as his dogs all turned tail and ran back to his truck. We had a story of a man simply named the farmer whose property was next to my elementary school. Story was that if you went on his property, he'd pull you into his house, which was entirely gray and barren, with nails poking out everywhere. He would get so mad about your trespassing that he would, and get this, call your parents and get you into trouble. Ha ha ha. Kids are funny. Especially because the story escalated dramatically from there. If he caught you a second time, he would pull you into his house and kill you, never to be found again just 0 to 60 on that one. As an adult, I think this is the funniest thing ever, but as a kid it was taken as gospel. You can imagine my pure terror when I actually saw the farmer while I was walking home late from school one day with a friend. He was hammering a no trespassing sign into his yard and hissed what are you kids doing? And we shakily replied walking home from school, to which he retorted well don't come on my property. We ran the rest of the way home and that single interaction probably gave another 5 years of legitimacy to the legend. In my town there is a story about a guy, everyone who tells it swears it happened to a friend's cousin or friend, who was driving in a rural part of the town in the middle of the night and saw a very beautiful girl hitchhiking. He picks her up with his car and starts driving towards the center of the town. While they are driving there he tries to start a conversation to get to know her. She never responds. When they reach the center of the town, she looks at him and says I would have taken you with me if only you didn't have that in the dash cabinet and leaves. He opens the dash cabinet and finds a cross his mom has left there to protect him. I was told this was a true story about a town in Wisconsin. This town has mostly corn fields and is flat, sort of a drive by town. There are some pretty deep woods off the highway that shelter a church. The church actually is from the late 1800s and has been long abandoned. At some point teenagers and some old creepy men took to performing satanic rituals at the church. They made attempts to call creatures from hell or interdimensional demons. After this goes on for some time they find everyone dead at the church after they've been missing for a couple days. Completely shredded and mutilated at the site. The general consensus is that they succeeded in their efforts but were unable to control what they had called. Now this jumps to a first-hand account from a social studies teacher I had in junior high. She claimed that this is well known in the town. That when you drive through the town's area around this church you do not stop your car. Whatever was called is still there, hunting at night. 
So social studies teacher's friend is driving through this area to visit a friend in the next town. He's blasting through this road surrounded by cornfields and minding his own business. Suddenly there's a terrible shrieking and ripping sound at the passenger side of the car and the car thumps hard. Thinking that something just blew, he carefully slows down and gets out to take stock. The scene is as such, the moon out and it's quiet in the middle of the country. The corn stands quietly in the dark with the headlights blazing in front of the car, illuminating the green of the fields. The engine ticking from the heat. No wind, but some small noise from the field as the corn plants touch each other. Walking around to the side closest to the field he observes the passenger side has a what appears to be claw marks that puncture the metal running from behind the front door all the way to the back bumper. The bumper is metal and it's been pulled back like something was hanging from it. Spooked and now knowing the car is still operable, the guy runs back and gets in, taking off quickly. Not too long after the man arrives at his friend's house. He brings his friend over to the car immediately and conveys the story to the friend. The man hearing all this turns sheet white. He then informs the friend of the story above about the church. He tells him that this happens to people from time to time, when people get out of their car, they usually disappear. From the streets of Metro Manila, Philippines. Story 1. One night, while alone driving home, a man notices that the car following him was flashing his lights and honking his horn randomly. So he pays no attention to it and continues on. When he gets home, he noticed that the car had followed him all the way. So a little peeved, he confronts the driver. The second driver explains that he had noticed a woman in the back seat of the man and was holding a knife ready to stab. So every time he honks or flashes the lights, the woman would disappear. The man says that he was alone the whole time. But upon opening the rear doors, there was a long knife on the back seat. Story 2. Late one night, a woman climbs aboard a jeepney. She notices that the driver is unusually quiet and glances at her frequently through the rear view mirror. But since the vehicle was moving, she was a bit apprehensive she was the lone passenger, but did not mind. As she was nearing her stop, the driver pulls over, looks at her with wild eyes and says, Miss, when you get home, take a bath and please burn your clothes. When I first saw your reflection on the mirror, you had no head. A common belief here is that when people see you and you have no head on, death is coming for you. In the northwest of Massachusetts, there is the legend of the Hoosack Tunnel. A mean old foreman was so involved in the blasting of the tunnel in Monroe, Ma, that supposedly he was responsible for some deaths of the workers excavating the railroad tunnel. Christmas break came, and the laborers left the camp to go back to their families for the holiday, but the miserable boss would stay at the camp, as he had no family. When the workers returned, they found him dead in the snow, with strangulation marks around his neck. But there was no footprints, other than his own, around his body. The werewolf of Morbach was a German urban legend I heard throughout my childhood. The story is set on autumn of 1988, in a small town called Wittelich. In a short story there was one small candle that lit the entire village, however when this candle was not lit a big hairy werewolf would come down and eat and terrorize the people of the village and would only return to the forest until the candle was lit again. It scared me so much even though I never lived anywhere near it. I looked it up on Google to see if it was a popular legend and you can find different verses of the story. BTW, this is sketchy AF. So-and-so's friend, a girl in her teens, is babysitting for a family in Newport Beach, CA. The family is wealthy and has a very large house, you know the sort, with a ridiculous amount of rooms. Anyways, the parents are going out for a late dinner slash movie. The father tells the babysitter that once the children are in bed she should go into this specific room, he doesn't really want her wandering around the house, and watch TV there. The parents take off and soon she gets the kids into bed and goes to the room to watch TV. She tries watching TV, but she is disturbed by a clown statue in the corner of the room. She tries to ignore it for as long as possible, but it starts freaking her out so much that she can't handle it. She resorts to calling the father and asks, Hey, the kids are in bed, but is it okay if I switch rooms? This clown statue is really creeping me out. The father says seriously, get the kids, go next door and call 911. She asks, what's going on? He responds, just go next door and once you call the police, call me back. She gets the kids, goes next door, and calls the police. When the police are on the way, she calls the father back and asks, so, really, what's going on? He responds, we don't have a clown statue. He then further explains that the children have been complaining about a clown watching them as they sleep. He and his wife had just blown it off, assuming that they were having nightmares. The police arrive and apprehend the clown, who turns out to be a midget. A midget clown. I guess he was some homeless person dressed as a clown, 
who somehow got into the house and had been living there for several weeks. He would come into the kids' rooms at nights and watch them while they slept. As the house was so large, he was able to avoid detection, surviving off their food, etc. He had been in the TV room right before the babysitter right came in there. When she entered he didn't have enough time to hide, so he just froze in place and pretended to be a statue. I'm not sure if this story has been told before because I'm not sure how well known it is. I heard it from a friend who heard it from an acquaintance they met while on vacation. The acquaintance was from Japan, which is where the story happened. As far as I have checked on the internet, it is not a commonly known story. I believe that this story originated from that acquaintance, who knew the family personally. A young girl, let's call her Hope for this retelling, had always been happy and carefree. She was energetic and enjoyed dancing and singing. But one day, Hope changed. She took on a comatose state. She didn't talk, she didn't move, she just lay in her bed all day, every day. Sick with worry, her parents took her to the hospital. After running dozens of tests, the hospital workers could find nothing wrong with the young girl. She was perfectly healthy and yet she still remained in a coma-like state. Eventually, the girl's health began to deteriorate. She lay in the hospital for months, losing weight and getting progressively worse. And yet, still, there was nothing clinically wrong with her. The hospital members had nothing to offer the parents except for kind words. After months of this, one nurse came to the mother and told her that Hope may not be with them much longer and that perhaps the mother would like to take her out for one last day in the park. Hope had loved the park. Her mother agreed, and she took Hope in a wheelchair to the nearby park. She was pushing her under the dense, beautiful trees, when something miraculous happened. Hope suddenly jumped up from her wheelchair and began to dance around. She twirled as flowers fell from the trees around her. She jumped and ran. Her mother watched in silence, tears of happiness dripping down her cheeks. Her mother snapped picture after picture of her beautiful daughter who she thought had made a miraculous recovery. However, after a few minutes, Hope returned to her wheelchair and to her comatose state. Her mother hastily returned her to the hospital and explained what had happened. The workers didn't have an explanation for it. That night, Hope passed away in her sleep. Her mother was hysterical. She couldn't understand what had happened or why her daughter had seemed to be better for those moments. A few weeks later, she developed the pictures she had taken of Hope. What she saw filled her with terror. There was Hope, but she was not alone. And she was not dancing. Behind her stood a demon, grinning maliciously as it held Hope up by her hair. The demon was swinging Hope's comatose body around. Hope had been possessed the whole time. A woman wakes up late at night in her drafty old farmhouse out in rural Ireland. Now, Houses in rural Ireland tend to be dark 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 and creaky weaky reeky. She has a border collie named Scruffy whom sleeps at her bedside every night and sometimes on the bed when she feels lonely. She wakes up one night and hears the tap downstairs running. Drip drip drip. She twists and turns for a while before finally realizing that she can't sleep with the silent insanity it reeks and so, she gives her dog a pat on the head, hops out of bed with a clumsy first step and steps into her slippers before shuffling off downstairs to tighten the tap. She gets downstairs and automatically tightens the knob before grumpily stomping back off upstairs because she has work in a few hours and it's freezing in the house. She gets back into bed and gives her dog a rub before she shuts her eyes and focuses on falling asleep in that counterintuitive way we humans do. She focuses so hard that when she finally opens her eyes she isn't actually sure if she fell asleep or not. Either way she hears the tap running again. Drip drip drip. She assumes that she has made a mistake and went to the wrong tap without listening properly to the source of the sound, so this time she goes into the bathroom and performs the old righty-tighty on the faucet. She heads back to bed, steps out of her slippers, bends over and lets her dog lick her hand before jumping back into bed and trying again to sleep. She focuses hard on it like the last time, shutting her eyes so tightly to keep out the cold, that she can hear the blood flow in her ears. When this doesn't work she sits up and looks out the window at the trees in the garden and the broken pottery that she hasn't had time to clean up. She drops her hand down and lets her dog give her a lick before lying down again for some rest at last as she now feels appeased. That is until she hears the return of the infernal water flow. Drip drip drip. At this point she's certain that one of her pipes must have a leak since she's certain that all the taps in the house are fully tightened. She's listening and listening for God only knows how long, petting her dog and thinking late night thoughts until... She realizes that this dripping sound is coming from her wardrobe which is unusual but not the strangest thing in the world. She pops out of bed, gets a lick from Scruffy and hops across the cold hardwood floor to the wardrobe before opening it and nearly swallowing her heart. She can't breathe. She can't move. She's paralyzed. She has the incapacitated mind of a mouse that has just looked into the eyes of Leviathan. 
Drip drip drip. It's Scruffy, dangling from the hanger pole with his throat slit, blood dripping from him. My dad told me this when I was a kid. Basically, Duck Mexico. When my grandpa was living in Mexico still, he used to go out and hunt animals and sell them to the local vendors. One day when he was gutting one, he found this weird ass looking stone. He kept it because it looked like nothing he ever seen. After he found it, he would have a bunch of luck with hunting but my grandma warned him to toss it somewhere cause it was cursed. One day he was sitting on top of a tree with his rifle and it seemed like his luck ran out cause he had nothing all day. So he sat there waiting and then he started hearing what sounded like chanting. He looked in the direction and saw torches and other things coming towards him. He stood up and saw ducking leprechauns. Scary as shit kind. They basically looked like demons but like humanoids. My grandpa jumped out of the tree, threw the rock, and ran the duck away from there. He ran back all the way home which I think was over 15 miles. He said he had never been so scared in his life. He ran all that as fast as he could. He never told my dad what they exactly looked like or any other details. My dad said he never liked to talk about it. Werewolves in the countryside of Brazil. I follow a page in FB, and the ADM shares real stories of sightings people send and comment there. A woman said that when she was a child and was sleeping in her room, heard a loud scratching noise in the bathroom door outside in the backyard, she only could fall asleep after it stoked, and the next morning, the door really was scratched so deep it almost made a hole. Her grandma said it was a werewolf, and when a werewolf visits your house, you need to say out loud come take your salt tomorrow, and the next day the person that transforms will knock on your door and ask for salt, you need to give it, so they never come back. Another woman commented, that her older brother made fun of a man, who was suspicious of being a werewolf in the neighborhood, and at night, the creature were in their backyard, and his mother told him to offer the man a dish of chicken and rice or farofa a Brazilian dish of rough flour of cassava and any kind of meat, because it is heavy food, so the man would leave him alone, and so he asked him to came at his house take the chicken and rice. He put the dish in the backyard, and at the morning it was empty. The werewolf man was never seen again by them. There's more of that from different people. I'm from a small town in Bosnia called Teshini. In my town there is a fortress on top of a hill called Gragina. And it's basically in the middle of the town. There is a legend on how it was built. Three brothers were building a fortress and every time they build it it would collapse. They were told that it would keep collapsing until they put a woman inside a wall. Well, the three brothers all had wives and they agreed that the next wife that brings them lunch would be the one. They weren't allowed to tell that to their wives, but the two older brothers didn't keep the secret so the wife of the youngest one brought lunch the next day and she ended up in the stone and from there on the fortress was indestructible. Another legend says that the Turks were doing some work on the fortress too and something similar happened. Everything they build would collapse. Someone told them to put a young woman who just had a newborn in the stone wall and it would stop. They did it, but left two openings on the wall so that the woman could breastfeed her child. The weird part is that to this day there are two openings on that very same spot that I've seen with my own eyes and that part of the wall there is always wet and a bit white no matter what. It is believed that women who have trouble producing breast milk can scrape of a bit of that moisture and their troubles would be no more. The Feral Girl of Mount Musalak. This story takes place back in the early 1900s. A girl got lost while on a school trip, and her classmates were surprisingly incompetent when searching for her. In either case, she was never found. But she didn't die. Instead, she adapted in this creepy way, evolving animal-like traits like claws and super speed, as well as an animal-like personality. She attacks hikers who stray too close to her territory. One sign that you're ducked is if you hear her scream. People have been attacked by what they imagine to be a naked, deranged woman with sharp teeth and claws. They come out of it with long, deep scratches that don't resemble any other animal's scratches, e. a bear, mountain lion, or any other known animal. I don't think she's ever killed anyone, but she's probably pissed that she never got back home. This story is native to where I grew up, Northeast New Hampshire. The Rake. Three years ago, I had just returned from a trip from Niagara Falls with my family for the 4th of July. We were all very exhausted after a long day of driving, so my husband and I put the kids right to bed and called it a night. At about 4 AM, I woke up thinking my husband had gotten up to use the restroom. I used the moment to steal back the sheets, only to wake him in the process. I apologized and told him I though he got out of bed. When he turned to face me, he gasped and pulled his feet up from the end of the bed so quickly his knee almost knocked me out of the bed. He then grabbed me and said nothing. After adjusting to the dark for a half second, I was able to see what caused the strange reaction. At the foot of the bed, sitting and facing away from us, there was what appeared to be a naked man, or a large hairless dog of some sort. 
Its body position was disturbing and unnatural, as if it had been hit by a car or something. For some reason, I was not instantly frightened by it, but more concerned as to its condition. At this point I was somewhat under the assumption that we were supposed to help him. My husband was peering over his arm and knee, tucked into the fetal position, occasionally glancing at me before returning to the creature. In a flurry of motion, the creature scrambled around the side of the bed, and then crawled quickly in a flailing sort of motion right along the bed until it was less than a foot from my husband's face. The creature was completely silent for about 30 seconds, or probably closer to 5, it just seemed like a while, just looking at my husband. The creature then placed its hand on his knee and ran into the hallway, leading to the kid's rooms. I screamed and ran for the light switch, planning to stop him before he hurt my children. When I got to the hallway, the light from the bedroom was enough to see it crouching and hunched over about 20 feet away. He turned around and looked directly at me, covered in blood. I flipped the switch on the wall and saw my daughter Clara. The creature ran down the stairs while my husband and I rushed to help our daughter. She was very badly injured and spoke only once more in her short life. She said he is the rake. My husband drove his car into a lake that night, while rushing our daughter to the hospital. They did not survive. Being a small town, news got around pretty quickly. The police were helpful at first, and the local newspaper took a lot of interest as well. However, the story was never published and the local television news never followed up either. For several months, my son Justin and I stayed in a hotel near my parents' house. After we decided to return home, I began looking for answers myself. I eventually located a man in the next town over who had a similar story. We got in contact and began talking about our experiences. He knew of two other people in New York who had seen the creature we now referred to as the rake. It took the four of us about two solid years of hunting on the internet and writing letters to come up with a small collection of what we believe to be accounts of the rake. None of them gave any details, history or follow-up. One journal had an entry involving the creature in its first three pages, and never mentioned it again. A ship's log explained nothing of the encounter, saying only that they were told to leave by the rake. That was the last entry in the log. There were, however, many instances where the creature's visit was one of a series of visits with the same person. Multiple people also mentioned being spoken to, my daughter included. This led us to wonder if the rake had visited any of us before our last encounter. I set up a digital recorder near my bed and left it running all night, every night, for two weeks. I would tediously scan through the sounds of me rolling around in my bed each day when I woke up. By the end of the second week, I was quite used to the occasional sound of sleep while blurring through the recording at eight times the normal speed. This still took almost an hour every day. On the first day of the third week, I thought I heard something different. What I found was a shrill voice. It was the rake. I can't listen to it long enough to even begin to transcribe it. I haven't let anyone listen to it yet. All I know is that I've heard it before, and I now believe that it spoke when it was sitting in front of my husband. I don't remember hearing anything at the time, but for some reason, the voice on the recorder immediately brings me back to that moment. The thoughts that must have gone through my daughter's head make me very upset. I have not seen the rake since he ruined my life, but I know that he has been in my room while I slept. I know and fear that one night I'll wake up to see him staring at me. My older sister told me about the candlelight prowler when I was very young. The prowler would break into houses at night, go into the children's rooms and stand there. With a candle in hand he would stand, looming over the child's bed until dawn. Most times the child would wake up, but they wouldn't say a thing. Not a peep. Maybe they would even go back to sleep. But most stayed awake all night not moving a muscle. In the morning the child would run into their parents' room screaming, and the only evidence he left was drops of wax on the bedroom floor. This by itself is creepy enough. There's an urban legend in Pickens County, Alabama of a face in the window of the courthouse. Basically, the previous courthouse was burned down and as the new one was being set up a mob accused a black man, Henry Wells, of burning down the former one. Henry Wells went up into the new courthouse while the mob surrounded it and told them that if they ended him that he would haunt them forever. At the moment that he said that lightning struck. After he was lynched there was a ghostly image of a face on the window pane. The story goes that no matter how many times it's replaced, the face always returns. A hunter is out in the woods and, after a long unsuccessful day, realizes night is quickly approaching. Knowing it would be impossible to make it home before dark, he wanders until he finds a cabin in the woods. He sets his gun on the porch and knocks on the door. The latch is broken and the door creaks open. He calls in to see if the cabin is occupied, but no one answers. The hunter steps in and looks around. He reaches for a light but finds there is no power. The cabin is one room, and the hunter feels his way around and finds a bed in the corner. He strips his clothes and collapses in the bed. 
From the bed the hunter looks around, and notices several portraits on the walls. He doesn't recognize any of the faces, although notices musingly that all the portraits seem to be staring at him. He falls into a deep comfortable sleep. Morning arrives. The hunter looks around the cabin during daylight for the first time. He realizes there are no portraits. Only windows. I'll start my own urban legend here if you'll allow me. Now to start off I consider myself a fairly sane and rational person. Any inexplicable event I have ever seen I have always traced back to some boring explanation. Except this one time. It was summer, I was with two friends, Will and Tom. We had gotten together to drink a few beers, play some video games, and watch some movies. Now before you start thinking we slapped some scary thoughts into our head with some game like Dead Space, or some horror movie, you're wrong. We were playing Micro Machines for Nintendo, and then we watched some Rocky Horror Picture Show. Overall just a fun night with a few beers, and I mean a few, none of us were slurring, no one was stumbling, we were buzzed at the max. So this is in the basement, and the room we are in is more of a nook in the basement. I'm sitting beside Tom in two chairs, there's a table in front of us, a couch on the left that Will is sitting on, and a TV past the table in the right corner. Behind where we are sitting is about 10 feet of empty space, and then the staircase upstairs. Just before this staircase though is a hallway leading to the rest of the basement. Now I don't even like to bring this up with these two guys because we're still uncomfortable about it all. Just sitting there watching movies. Tom and I can only see the TV and the wall in front of us, we're blind to the hallway behind us, but while sitting on the couch can see it. As we're about midway through Rocky Horror we start noticing we're looking past us in kind of an odd way. So I ask what's going on, what is he looking at? Tom chimes in right away saying he's seen him looking past us over a dozen times now, and quickly looking back to the TV, what the hell is he seeing? So Will says it's nothing, he's probably a little tired, but he keeps seeing a face pop around the corner behind us. We're like what? A robber? What the hell man? He assures us it's not a robber, and just shrugs it off as him maybe being tired, and maybe being slightly drunk, even though he didn't appear to be either. So it's Tom's house, and he's a bit unnerved by this face peeking around the corner, so we flick on the lights and look around and obviously find nothing. Back to watching the movie, and after 15 to 20 minutes Will is again looking past us, and rapidly back to the TV. At this point he kind of whispers okay guys, I'm creeped out now, it's back. So now we're making fun of his probably drunk ass, but now he's refusing to shrug it off, he's saying there is actually something there. So I decide to sit beside him on the couch, telling him I'll keep an eye out on the corner with him, and we'll see. I also make sure to sit behind him, so when he looks at the corner he's looking away from me. So now the TV is almost straight in front of me, slightly left, Will is on the right, Tom is further back still sitting in the chair with his back to the corner, I start glancing every so often towards the corner. Every glance brings a little disappointment that I'm not seeing anything. Finally about 20 minutes later, I glance over to this corner as I'm swigging my beer, and very rapidly pops out this head. It looks charred black, the eyes are glowing red, almost like they're reflecting fire, and it has this huge shit-eating grin on its face. A grin that says I'm going to eat you before the night is out. Right as it disappears back behind the corner, our buddy Tom jumps out of his chair, kicks it backwards behind him as if to act as a barrier towards something coming from behind. He then proceeds to yell I thought you guys were messing with me, but you both went pale, and looked horrified at exactly the same time. Just one of those reactions you can't fake, where we both just reacted at exactly the same instant. So we're now all freaking out pressed up against the wall waiting for this thing to appear again. We wait a good 3 to 4 minutes, then finally work up the nerve to approach the light switch, right near the corner. We grab a baseball bat from nearby, and go hunting for whatever the hell is in the basement. Now we had just searched this basement, so we were familiar with where everything was. Just some boxes filled with records, a shelf of cassettes, and a pile of boxes in the center of the room. Well some of the cassettes were pulled off the shelf. Some of the boxes were now in the center of the floor, and a bunch of the records were laid out on the floor as well. This creeped us the hell out. We checked the whole basement, nothing. Move upstairs together, search the entire house, nothing. Not an open door, not an open window, nowhere to hide. We finally give up the hunt, and all huddle onto the couch, where we watch another movie, and hope the thing doesn't make another appearance. It didn't, and we didn't sleep at all. Still to this day, we have no good ideas for what the hell happened, besides something crazy like we were all exposed to fumes leaking into his basement, or something random like that. I will never forget that charred face, with that grin, and the horrible red glowing eyes, and I wonder if anyone else has ever seen the face? So I'm in the US Air Force. 
I've heard this damn story twice. From two different people. They both had completely separate encounters with this same house. It goes like this. In base housing at Kadena on the island of Okinawa there are duplex houses. Back in the 80s a military member ended his entire family and committed suicide. The other side of the duplex continued to be used without problem, but the other side was left empty. Below are the two accounts I was given first hand. Subject, this was my ex-wife's brother. He was security forces stationed there, staff sergeant type. Apparently kids know about this place and do all sorts of stupid dare shit and try to break in to freak each other out. Some of this guy's friends are on duty and get a call saying somebody's been screwing around and to check the place out. They're apprehensive of course because the place is well known as having a very evil vibe. So these two a girl and a guy roll up and park in front. They walk around back to where there's a sliding door and a little porch area. Sure as shit it's been jimmied and they decide to look inside. They get in and it's dark as balls. The inside hasn't been maintained and it's nasty, the electrical doesn't work either so it's just flashlights. After they enter the dude stops and cocks his head like he's hearing something. Then he turns to the girl and tell her to go outside. She asks why? He replies, just go outside and wait for me. She's confused but does as he asks. After another 5 minutes the guy walks outside and looks at her, then turning back to look at the house. She then asks why he told her to leave. He turns to her and says, I heard a voice telling me to kill you. It sounded like someone was standing next to me whispering killer 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 her killer and I didn't know what would happen if you stayed, so I had you leave. Included in the story was this, the house has two statues by the front door. These statues are everywhere and meant to provide protection from spirits. These two are turned towards the house, the prevent what an inside from escaping. The boy was restless that night. His mind raced with troubling thoughts, and he tossed and turned, trying to block them out and get some sleep. He looked at the alarm on his nightstand and a dimly green 312 blinked back at him. He really needed to get that fixed. He turned away from the clock towards his doorframe and decided to try to force it. Clenching his eyes shut, he tried to think about nothing. Right as he started having some success, he heard a dull thumping coming from the stairs. That's weird, he thought, as he knew both of his parents were usually asleep by now. He squinted out of the cracked door, heart racing. At the end of the hallway was the huge silhouette of someone, or something. It lumbered towards his parents' bedroom, the thumping surprisingly quiet for a figure that size. The boy broke out into a cold sweat and clenched his eyes shut again. He was imagining things. That was probably just his dad, the shadows were playing tricks in the night, he reassured himself. Just as he was certain it hadn't been real, he heard a louder thunk from his parents' bedroom. Then came a muffled gasping. The boy's heart was racing and he almost called out for his parents. No, he kept telling himself, that'll make him have to tie me up, too. I'll let him steal what he wants and leave. He pretended to be asleep, slowing his breathing, though every muscle in his body was tense. The thumping started up again, and it was getting louder. This time it was accompanied with a soft dragging sound. Both came closer, and closer. The boy was paralyzed with fear. The thumping was in his room now. It was all he could do to not whimper. He heard shuffling and drawer open and close. Then it stopped, and the thumping started up again. It stopped right next to his bed, and then he heard ruffling and dragging. The thing had wedged itself underneath his bed. The boy felt tears forming as he forced himself not to scream. The boy waited for what seemed like hours, but there were no sounds, and no movement. He knew he couldn't stay there forever, he had to make a run for it. He had to make sure he could get to the door before the thing could grab him. He slowly half opened his eyes, carefully adjusting to the light. What he saw next drove all thoughts of escape from his mind. Leaning against his wall were the bodies of his mom and dad, locked in a bloody embrace. Their heads lay in their laps, mouths open in terror. The boy barely muffled a scream before seeing a trail of dark black leading from their gaping necks. Above their bodies, scrawled in their blood, was a message. I know you're awake. A boy is tucked into bed by his babysitter. He is warned not to leave his room and go downstairs since she is having a special friend over. He falls asleep, but later on he wakes up to a sound. Thump. Thump. Drag. He lays still and hears it again. Thump. Thump. Drag. The sound is somewhere downstairs or maybe even on the staircase. He knows he can't leave his room. The babysitter told him not to. He hides under his sheets and continues to hear the sound. But the time between the sounds grows longer and longer. 30 seconds pass. Thump. Thump. Drag. A minute passes. Thump. Thump. Drag. Eventually the sound stops after what seems like forever to the boy. 
he slowly falls asleep, but is immediately awoken by his father. He is told to close his eyes and to keep them closed until they are outside. There was an accident, that's all his father would say. His father scooped him up and carried him into the hallway and down the stairs. Now, you can't tell a kid not to look at something and expect them to listen. The boy slowly peeked his eyes open and saw the true horror. The babysitter was dead at the top of the staircase. Her legs were bloody stumps. A trail of blood lead from the couch to her final resting spot. The boy suddenly realized. The sounds he heard earlier in the night were coming from the babysitter. She tried to get to his bedroom for help. She tried to climb the stairs by throwing her arms out in front of her to drag the rest of her body up. Thump. Thump. Drag. But why didn't she yell for help he pondered. Maybe he could have helped her if she did that. As the boy was carried through the front door he saw a smaller blood puddle. In it laid something. Something motionless and red. Something that looked like meat. That something was the babysitter's tongue. From the age of 13 to 15 I went to an all-boys school in Ireland. The school was a past orphanage in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The school is huge, huge to the point that in my first year I skipped multiple classes and just said I got lost and they completely understood. The teachers who were close to retirement had relatives who got taken off the street to go to work because they were not attending school and it was blamed on the parents. The stories we heard was blood curdling. But one in particular had me more curious than scared. Boys aged 12 to 16 used to work in the school when it was an orphanage. But it was borderline slavery. They would get whipped and beat half to death if the work wasn't done properly. So apparently there was a child there who was part of group on roof repair. Keep in mind this school is huge in terms of height and width. So during roof repair he jumped off the roof falling to his death. A picture of this kid still remains in the school and he looked like a genuinely creepy kid. Tales he wanders the school sounded like BS to me at the time. But sometimes walking out of school late had me a little scared because of the just creepy and paranormal activity in general. They called him Blue Boy because he always looked sad in all of the photos of him. I got expelled from that school. There's a semi-rural town about 40 minutes from where I live, and it has open farmlands at the top of town, and cold rainforest valleys in the bottom of town. The rainforest areas are scattered with old brick railway tunnels for the coal trains back in the day, and many of them have caved in at one end the tunnels are full of glow worms, and are incredibly beautiful to walk into at night, with ceilings of bright blue sparkles. One night my new boyfriend and I were drinking at his place with another couple and I came up with the idea of exploring the glow tunnels together, since I'd never been. We set off as a group of four and walked through the rainforest and through the shorter, open tunnels with not many worms, and even with only a few worms, it was magical. Boyfriend said that the closed tunnels were best for glow worms, so we went to find one. We'd walked about five minutes into a tunnel that had caved at one end, and it had a shallow stream of water pooled in the bottom of it. At first there had only been a smattering of the little glowy dudes, but here it looked incredible, like a scene from Harry Potter. We're standing there, staring in wonder, when my boyfriend decides to ruin the moment by saying that apparently a little girl had paddled her canoe along the stream and into the tunnel, when flash floods had suddenly drowned her. They retrieved the canoe but not the girl. After a beat of silence, the rest of us sort of nervously laughed and then suddenly a ducking rock the size of my fist lobs out of the dark from the closed end of the tunnel, landing in the water at our feet. Running in the dark, through ankle deep water, on sludgy rocks, is like running in a nightmare. Duck the closed tunnels. In the early 1900s in York County, Pennsylvania, a small town called Hellam contained an insane asylum. This is how a lot of stories start. The hospital entrance was located on Toad Road on what some would consider a compound to keep inmates slash patients away from the general populations. From Toad Road there were seven security checkpoints to check vehicles for hidden escapees or to check for people not supposed to enter. These seven checkpoints are what is now referred to as the seven gates of hell. One evening as the hospital was shutting down a man who often claimed he didn't belong in there attacked a doctor. He knew he wouldn't be able to make it out so he dressed himself in the doctor's clothes took the keys and made his way out the door. To distract other guards and doctors he set a fire in one of the hallways. Because of the fire doctors and guards attempted to restrain inmates and patients for removal from the hospital. However some fought back, grabbed guns from the guards and started shooting. The local police and, according to the legend, National Guard slash Army were called in to assist in capturing inmates. By the time other authorities had arrived inmates had just about taken over. Guards were running, doctors who didn't make it out were ended. It was complete mayhem. By this time the army and police officers were given the order shoot to kill. The sane less aggressive inmates made it closer to the final gate, where the completely insane were ended either in the woods circling to the grounds or caught and killed in one of the river beds between the various checkpoints. Some of you now looking for the road, 
Toad Road is gone, Hurricane Agnes washed it away, as it was nothing more than a dirt road. What stands in its place now is Trout Run Road. Going back Trout Run Road on the left-hand side is what is left of the first security checkpoint. Two old-looking pillars which now holds a simple single-arm gate which is locked with chains and padlocks. According to the legend once you go beyond this gate, you will find a simple overgrown path leading to a second gate, heading through these gates you will start to notice weird things going on around you, lights in the trees, moans and screams, random gunshots, etc. Continue following the path and you will find five more gates, some still more intact than the others some completely destroyed. The further back you go the worse it gets. The scarier it gets. Screams lights, unexplained things touching you. Until you pass through the final gate, which is said to take you straight to hell. Many, many years ago, on a Saturday evening, a boy named Manuel left home to go to a dance located in La Furia. Halfway there he noticed a very beautiful girl wearing a pink dress. Even though he did not know the girl he asked her if she was in need of a favor. The girl replied, yes, I am in need of a ride to a dance. Gladly, Manuel offered her a ride and she gratefully accepted. Her name was Maria, but she was not known by many people because she had been away for 10 years. When they arrived at the dance, many discovered that the girl had problems with the new styles of dance but was the best polka dancer they had ever seen. After midnight, couples started to leave the dance. As the couple exited, Manuel put his coat over Maria's shoulders. On the way home, Maria had asked to be left at the exact spot in which she was picked up. Manuel wanted to escort her to her house but she insisted that she be alone. She offered his coat back but was told to keep it until the next morning when he would visit her. The next morning Manuel arrived at the same spot he had left Maria and found a little white house about a quarter mile away. As he drove up a lady opened the door. Manuel asked if he could see Maria, but the lady froze. Maria? Maria has been dead for 10 years. But miss, this is not possible. I took her to the dance last night. We had such a good time and she looked so beautiful polka dancing in her pink dress. I even lent her my coat. The lady started to cry. My daughter was the best polka and corrido dancer, and she was buried in a very pretty pink dress. I'm telling you that she died in an accident 10 years ago. Come with me. I know what will change your mind. The two of them walked silently to a cemetery. It was true. There before them was a stone with the inscription, Maria Lozano, 1920-1940, R.I.P. And upon the grave, Manuel's coat. That whole evening Manuel had been dancing with a ghost. I will tell you the story of the doll in the attic. There is a small town in rural Minnesota. If you know where to look, you will find a house with an attic window. The doll will be staring down at you. Most people don't see it these days, since the highways were rerouted a few years ago to go around the town instead of through it. But the doll's still there, just like it has been for decades. Nobody knows why it's there, unmoving. Some say that a little girl was locked in the attic for days until she died of thirst, and the doll is a memorial. Some say that a little girl disappeared from the park across the street, and the doll stands in the window to watch over the children who play there to this day. Some say there was a little boy in the house who was mentally disabled or disturbed, and when the people of the town made his life hell, he hanged himself in the attic window for all to see, and the doll is a reminder to the townsfolk. There is a man who lives in the house, but he will not speak about the doll. They say he's left a time capsule in the town with the secret of the doll but it won't be open for another 200 years, long after he and you and I have turned to dust. On the day the capsule is opened, I think. Okay, this isn't really a legend, but more of a personal experience. Behind my yard, my yard being very expansive and me living in Kentucky, there's a patch of woods that in total, with the trails included, stretches out over around 2 miles, possibly more. Me and my friends discovered this around 3 years ago, at the time, we were in our infancy stage of airsofting and played almost every day. One day, we actually went to play in the woods despite there only being four of us. It had started to drizzle and light was fading, we stopped at the mouth of the woods and agreed to all come back to the entrance should we decide it was raining too hard. Me and my partner Elijah ventured down the trail, not deviating from the trail at all. Around five minutes into playing, we get really paranoid and decided to hunker down. We each take a knee and cover each other's backs. Elijah notifies me that he sees some movement in front of us, upon inspection in the now blackness of the woods in front of me, I could tell whatever it was couldn't be Doug or Trevor, members of the other team, I tell him to get behind me and slowly walk about 30 feet before sprinting to the entrance of the woods. This wasn't an easy task because of the mud and water, it made any movement incredibly audible, our voices only being covered by the rain. I digress, he does as I commanded and after I hear him leave, I fire around three bursts from my shotgun hoping it would warrant the thing to run away. 
After this, I run away myself. Elijah and I rendezvous with each other in the field outside the mouth of the trail, we pant and wait for Trevor and Doug to come out, hoping they'd believe what we were going to tell them. Ironically, still in a state of shock ourselves, Doug and Trevor came flying out of the woods, with crazed looks on their faces. This shocked Elijah and I both as we hardly ever see Doug and Trevor express any form of weakness. They proceed to tell us their own story of what they had just experienced. As it so happens, they were lying in a bunker we had created that lied only feet from where me and Elijah had been kneeling. In any case, Doug described how they were scanning for movement while lying in the bunker, when suddenly he felt a large presence rush behind him and was breathing along the nape of his neck. They both then proceeded to be like shit and hit the trail. In the heat of the moment, and us discussing what happened, we hear a blood-curdling screech from the woods, this pushing us into a full sprint as we had never heard this cry before. To this day, we can't possibly place an idea as to what it might have been. Food is plentiful for a creature of which we deem to be bipedal and mammal-like. Deer inhabit the area along with rabbits, fox, and wolves. Whatever the hell it was, we had a strict rule of staying the hell out of those woods at night.